Matt Pat jump scare. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where today I'm gonna tell you a ghost story. So, if you've ever watched even a fraction of my stuff that I do online, you'll know that I was a theater kid. Oh, the places I would like to show. A big theater kid. No device is a safety tonight. <laughs> Like I said, just pure, unadulterated theater trash. And it goes all the way back to when I was in kindergarten. For my first career day, I actually remember that I dressed up in a suit and a tie. Here was everyone else in their cute little firefighter hats or their doctor's coats or whatever. And here I was, little mini Matt Pat, looking like the world's teeniest, tiniest accountant. When adults asked me what I was dressed as, I would say, I'm an actor, because apparently I thought actors wore the fanciest, most nicest clothing out there how wrong I was. As most of you know at this point, I went to college for a combination of theater and neuroscience. And while I was there, I tried to do as many shows as humanly possible. I played every role from a, a neurotic manservant to a neurotic court jester to a, to a neurotic Halloween monster. In other words, I had range. That's what they would call it in the business. But there was this one semester where I don't know, just everything that was being produced looked boring. The musical was one I'd done before, and the theater department show was what theater department shows always are at colleges. Something esoteric and weird. I am commenting on this couch. I am commenting on the teeny cubby in this room. This is what my character would choose. Also, can I just say I love the full 360 tour that you're getting of the GT Live studio right now. Anyway, I loved all of this stuff. Like I said, pure theater trash. And after all, if I was going to be making a career in theater, this is my job, right? So I could not be doing a show for a couple months. So I did what was probably the unthinkable. I crossed enemy lines. I went to audition at the rival school. Can we fire up like a dramatic chipmunk or what's, what's a good relevant version of dramatic chipmunk these days? It's not betrayal, but there's like this one bit from Zoolander where he turns around and then Owen Wilson is like walking all fabulous and it's like, who is she? Can I just say this? I, I love that I asked for a more relevant example than the dramatic chipmunk and the response that I got back was Zoolander, <laughs> you know, that classic Ben Stiller movie that predates all of this. Uh, honestly, no one had ever done that sort of thing before, because I guess no one had ever really thought about it. Like, oh, you could audition at the rival school? No way. Well, I did. Um, and I don't know if I can truly impress upon you how big of a thing this was, because uh, I went to Duke, and it has like one of the all-time most intense rivalries against the neighboring school, United, United Church of Christ. <laughs> not the United Church of Christ, the University of North Carolina, or UNC for short. And let me tell you, I pulled out all the stops for this audition. Uh, in general, my auditions tended to be unique. But that tango. For this one in particular, I wanted to make a big impression to the other school, so I went in and I did a dramatic monologue of Bet On It from High School Musical 2. Uh, in case you've repressed your memories over that Disney original production, here's the refresher. To see Sal. And I recognize your face out on my own. Ah, oh, just look at that Disney Channel original movie level water reflection right there. And, and you heard me right. I didn't sing the song. I said it as a monologue, not singing. The struggles of being Troy Bolton forced onto a golf course. Here, let me see if I can uh, pull up a moment here. Everybody's always talking at me. Everybody's trying to get in my head. I've got to listen to my own heart talking. I've got to listen to myself instead. Bet on it. Bet on it. Bet on it. Bet on me. Long story short, I clearly got the part. <laughs> the show oh, was this crazy show called Urine Town, which if you haven't heard of it, I'm not surprised. It's not super popular with a name like Urine Town. It's actually a joke that they write into the musical, but uh, it's about this world where you have to pay to pee because they've run out of water. You know, theater show's gonna theater, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, it was while I was being a turncoat at UNC that I met this girl named Haley, who is a UNC alum, who, inspired by my galaxy-brained maneuvering here, actually crossed back over to my school, Duke, to audition. And unlike me, Haley was actually good. Like, legitimately very good. Like, good enough to perform in front of the entirety of a packed Yankees baseball stadium. Roll a clip. Literally. 
legit right to just casually drop in the high notes in front of 46,000 sports fans. Sure. Way to show off there, honey. Anyway, Haley and I bonded over the fact that we were the defectors, the ones that were willing to cross enemy lines, as it were. Uh, we were casual friends all throughout the rest of college. We graduate, life happens, everyone moves on. You know, how it goes. I become that big nerd guy over on YouTube, that part you're probably a bit more familiar with. But then, out of nowhere, at the top of this year, I see a familiar name pop up in my inbox. It's Haley. Dear Matt, hello there, it's been too long. I am now the mother of a six-year-old, time happens fast, and uh, my stepson, who is a budding video game composer. He's amazing. And his favorite show to watch online, much to my surprise, an old familiar voice from college, you. Pretty cool. Uh, we watch you every week. I don't always understand it all, you and me both, uh, but you've made a huge difference in his life. Thank you. Um, I'm saying all of this not to humble brag about like, whoa, look at how important I was to the, her son's childhood, but rather for the context of what comes next. So this is completely random, but I'm producing shows on Broadway now. You know, just casual drop. I'm just a big time Broadway producer, whatever. And the latest project to come across my desk is Grey House, a psychological thriller slash horror play coming to Broadway this May, and I thought of you and Steph immediately for this. After years of watching you, I just feel like this would be such a fit, because it combines horror, mystery, and theater. And it would be introducing a brand new genre to Broadway, which is it's so craving. Let me know if you'd like to get on a phone, blah blah blah, etc, etc. Definitely a different email than I was expecting there, but uh, long story short, we said yes to meeting with Haley, and honestly, that's how we learned about what the show was, which is really cool. Uh, a couple gets into a car crash during a blizzard up in the mountains and winds up trapped in this mysterious cabin inhabited by a group of strange girls who, get this, may or may not be dead. Mm hmm? Mm, a lot of alarm bells ringing, a lot of theorist checkpoints there. There's this strange glowing that's coming from the basement. There are pentagrams carved into the floor. There are monsters literally crawling out of the walls. And throughout the whole thing, you have hidden messages sprinkled throughout, hidden in stuff like Morse code and sign language. I mean, put your jazz hands away, ladies and gentlemen. Hamilton, this is not. And the whole thing stars Sofia Ann Caruso from Beetlejuice, Tatiana Maslany from She-Hulk, and Millicent Simmons from A Quiet Place. And the whole thing is being directed by the director who did Wicked. Like, it is a stacked creative team. But uh, let's be honest, none of that mattered. They had me the second they said dead kids. So we said yes to investing in Grey House. Now, normally what that would mean is that you just write a check. That's all it is. You literally are just helping to support the arts with a bunch of other people because creating theater in New York is expensive. And hey, if the show goes well, you get some of that money back. Awesome. But surprising literally no one, Steph and I weren't just content to leave it alone. You guys know that we are type A personalities. Well, I'd go so far as to say we are type A plus personalities because if we're doing a thing, then we are doing it, doing it. So Steph and I are all like, hey, you know, we have 12 plus years of experience solving spooky mysteries and horror things online. I think there's a little bit more that we could do to help the production. Since this is a horror and mystery show, maybe, I don't know, have you thought about doing some dances over on TikTok or maybe an influencer night? How about an ARG? L let me sit you down and talk to you about how Jimmy Neutron crosses over into the Grubhub universe they were a bit confused. And so we met more and more of the marketing team and the creative teams that were putting the show on. And we had some calls that were full of some of the biggest names in the theater world. And, and let me tell you, at first, those calls were, I mean, I gotta be frank, they were uncomfortable. Uh, let me explain why. Uh, you see, we have, like I said, been doing this for 12 years. We know this world. If I tell the editors to do this. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. When you're not really fine, you just, Right? You know exactly what this means. You know what we're referencing. Or it's something even more obscure if we do this. Nani? Or most obscure of all, this. We all are chronically online, so we know the way, and we also know why we probably shouldn't be talking about the way anymore. But to the outside theater world, oh boy, this whole thing, this is a big old black box. Actually, it is worse than a black box. This right here, this digital video land, it is the home of Broadway's most dreaded two words, slime tutorials. And we're not talking about literal slime tutorials where we're making things for kids. No, my friends. Uh, theater has to be really restrictive when it comes to filming shows because of all the copyrights and union rules and performances involved. Each show is allowed to just be filmed once and only once for archival purposes. That copy is then stored in one very specific library in a corner of New York. But don't think that you can just roll in and start watching the original cast of Beetlejuice on repeat. No, 
you absolutely can't. You can only watch that taped recording one time in your entire life, and only if you can prove they have a research-based reason to watch it in the first place. So in a world where we are literally dripping in an excess of content, let's just say that theater has itself a bit of an accessibility problem. And as you see with any business, a problem of accessibility ultimately gives rise to piracy, or in this case, slime tutorials, the secret coded word for any bootlegged video recording of a Broadway show. In a world where people want to see theater, but just can't because of all the restrictive nature around it or the high price point, slime tutorials have basically stepped in here on YouTube to fill in the gap. Most of them are really terrible quality. They are definitely illegal, but if you really want to see a show and you just can't afford to, or you can't make it to the theater while it's performing, well, that's what a lot of people have turned to. And to the people in the theater world who don't understand and our corner of the internet, that right there, that is what digital video is. And so here we are starting to roll into producer meetings, me and Steph, Mr. and Mrs. Internet Video asking, hey guys, have you ever thought about opening your doors and considering letting theater influencers film bits of the rehearsals or maybe get shots of the set being constructed? Bring them along for the journey of the show. It got awkward fast. To them, that was just letting the slime flow forth. And it didn't help either that theater is literally one of the oldest art forms in the world. And Broadway, it is like the most entrenched of institutions that involve thousands of people to put on these products. But the coolest thing about the process here was that at the end of the day, even though they were nervous and they were definitely uncertain about some of the stuff that we were talking about, they said yes. At least they kept an open mind to learning more. They wanted to be educated. And bit by bit, we watched as the walls began to erode between these two worlds. There started to be more conversation. We started to have more of the same language. Yes to a YouTube strategy. Yes to doing weird stunts like having creepy demon girls wandering around Times Square lurking in the backgrounds of people's tourist photos to help promote this thing virally. Yes to an influencer night. Can you believe that? This this was one of the first shows on Broadway, if not the first show to invite online creators to a preview event. Film studios have been doing that for a long time at this point, but theater, this was like mind blowing to them. And let me tell you, the mood was electric. People there were so excited to be a part of this launch event. I finally got the chance to meet with Thomas Sanders, who I've been wanting to meet for years, but we're always just like ships passing in the night, as well as Ron Boo, who, you know, we cover a fair bit across the channels. There was also Gamer from Mars, Wait in the Wings, Swell Entertainment, all people that that I love to watch. I was sent an email uh, saying that I was invited to Grey House on Broadway May 10th, and I immediately was like, what? So I know what you're thinking, Amanda, why you? I don't know. I still don't know. I do, Amanda. It was us. It was us and the creative team being fans of your work and wanting you to be a part of this thing. And now it's been done, right? Creators and Broadway have finally crossed over and hopefully now that it's been done once, it's easier to happen again and again and again. And we're already starting to see that happen. A week after we did that influencer night, the main creative team asked Steph and I if it was a good idea for them to start their own subreddit so people could discuss the lore of the show and solve it together online. And we're like, yes, absolutely. That's a great idea. Also, you used the word subreddit right. A week ago, that wouldn't have been the case. They were like, hey, do you think it would be a good idea if we started to give away free tickets? Would people like that? And we're like, duh, of course. Who wouldn't want that sort of thing, guys? It's not rocket science. You know, when I started doing Theories 10, 12 years ago, ancient, I'm literally dust. I was living in New York, right? I was on those streets. I was pounding the pavement in the theater district. The show opened, what, like two or three blocks away from where I would wake up every morning, get there at 4 a.m. to stand in line for them to finally open the door at 6 a.m. so I could wait all day to try and get an audition. That never happened. This was a time in my life where splitting a Chipotle burrito was the big meal of the week because it was what Steph and I could afford based off of the budget that we had at the time. And now, here we are, trying to help shape this industry that was so pivotal to my early life. We're trying to update it. We're trying to make it exciting and alive for a brand new generation of artists and fans. And that's, it's kind of unreal. I let you guys know over on Game Theory that I was gonna be there for the opening week of the show. And because this is a show with mysterious lore that you just wanna discuss with your friends in order to solve, we even did a talk back with all you theorists in the audience. And well, I've done just so many, too many to count when it comes to talkbacks and presentations and onstage performances and whatever. This one was special. I mean, this was on a Broadway stage. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say, like this was literally kindergarten Matt Pat's dream come true. Hello, Broadway. 
Welcome to the Grey House Talkback, everyone. Look, there it is. My bio in a Broadway program. And uh, I'm gonna flash it up on screen real quick for you to read. Uh, there's an ARG in there. We're like, well, if we're in a Broadway theater, like, might as well throw in an ARG mystery for you to solve. That alone would have made it enough. Like, wow, this is incredible. I get to stand on a Broadway stage and talk. Like, that was awesome. But then you guys showed up. And let me say that the theater was packed. And the conversation that we had about the show, it was, it was incredible. You guys are amazing. How many of you enjoyed the show? Great. How many of you have questions about the show? <laughs> Great, yep, that is totally to be expected. Your theories about the show were wonderful. We even got to throw in a Five Nights at Freddy's reference. It's the best jump scare ever. Eat your heart out, Five Nights at Freddy's. Five Nights at Freddy's on Broadway. Never thought that crossover was gonna happen, but that is now on the 2023 bingo card. If you wanna see, actually, the full talkback that we did, it is here on YouTube. I'll link to it in all the usual places. The show wasn't done when the theater closed. As we left, there were just so many of you out on the street. A group of people so big that, without exaggeration, they had to shut the street down in front of the theater. I mean, that right there, that was incredible. We didn't get to actually go to the after party celebrating the show until hours after everyone else was there because we were trying to spend as much time as possible talking to you guys. First Broadway opening. Right, after party. Woo, we're here. We're, we we're here, it, what, like an hour? Late. Half late? Yeah. It's okay. It's all right. I was told by one of the producers on the show that this is the sort of thing that doesn't tend to happen on Broadway, but you guys. You made it happen. The reason I'm telling this story now is because it's time for the production to wrap up. We're revving up for the final performances. We're getting ready to close the doors. So now felt like the perfect time to actually just tell you this story. One that has just been a tremendous personal achievement for me and a testament to everything that we as a collective theorist community has been able to do together. So if you do want to be a part of that history and see how the show comes together before all record of it gets relegated to a random New York library in the corner, grab a ticket now, my friends. Link is in the description. In fact, if you use the code GHTheorist, you can save 10 bucks on your tickets. Not only is this show awesome, it's mysterious, it's scary, it's thought provoking, but also it takes place in a haunted theater. Nothing to see there, just a ghost in the corner. Oh, it's a pipe. <laughs> and while I could certainly just end the video right here now, hey, that's a theory, a film theory, but it wasn't, blah, blah, blah. I do want to leave you with one last thing. You see, this show, also an incredible showcase for both hearing and non-hearing actors using sign language all throughout the presentation. And through this process, I was actually fortunate enough to speak to the director of artistic sign language, Andrew Morrill, who spoke to us about the evolution of sign language and how it's used throughout this show. It's long, but it is a fascinating clip, which is why I wanted to share it with you here right at the end. So enjoy that as I leave you here. And as always, my Friends, remember, it's just a theory. A film theory! And scene. You mentioned setting and taking into account setting. Do different settings come with different considerations when teaching things around sign language or creating the language of the world that you're putting up on stage? Yeah, absolutely. So Grey House is set in the 70s. We signed differently in the hmm. 70s than we do now. So we have to huh. figure out exactly how to represent that way we signed in the 70s in this show. So we have a deaf character in the show and we have some ASL in the show, but that's just one part of the story. It's not the featured part of the story. It's just that one of the characters happens to be deaf in this world. We don't want the sign language to essentially pull focus on the story. It's just that we have a deaf character in the story. Could you give us an example of something that would be different today than it was in the 70s, just so we could get a visual cue of that? Sure, yes. So ASL, we don't have so much documentation of the actual language because there's no written form of ASL. Whereas with English, hmm. we can see how it's changed from you know Shakespearean times up until modern times. But we didn't have the technology in the 60s and 70s to fully document our language and kind of codify it for the masses. But I will give you a simple example. So in the 70s, we used to sign in English word order rather than in our American Sign Language grammar. Let's take the example, the sentence, who are you? Today, we would sign it like this, mm -hmm. who are you? But in the 70s, we would sign, mm -hmm. who are you? Yeah. So these are little nuances. They might not seem like a lot to you, but definitely the deaf audience that comes to see our show will be able to appreciate and take in those nuances. Uh, are there any techniques that you use to help the actors learn sign, sign language faster? 
or how, how does that teaching process develop? We usually have ASL sessions built into the rehearsal. I'll talk with the actor about their character, what they think works for their character, why are you signing in that moment, why are you not signing in that moment, and then I get into the text and start teaching them the translations. I record myself with those translations and send it to them so they can work on their own. I have to say that this cast has been phenomenal with learning sign language. They're all such quick studies. They learn so much in such a short amount of time. We have such an amazing cast, so grateful for, for all of them. Thank you.